Welcome to the I Got Fired podcast, where we help people who have been fired or afraid that they might be. I am Tom Spiggle. I am host of the podcast and founder of the Spiggle Law Firm, uh, where we represent people in the Washington, D.C. metro area and all throughout Virginia. <clears throat> so this is a follow up on my podcast about contingency fee arrangements. In my last episode, um, if you haven't listened to it, you check it out. I talk about what a contingency fee arrangement is and how it works. And today, as promised, I want to talk to you about how you maximize your chances of getting a contingency fee arrangement. And in particular, some things you want to avoid doing that may result in a law firm declining your case. Um, the first thing is, you know, remember, you are with a contingency fee arrangement. You are asking the law firm to um, uh, to invest in your case. Oh, and actually, before I go any further, I forgot uh, my because lawyer section. That is, this uh, this is not intended as legal advice. It's educational for you. Uh, if you need legal advice specific to your case, then you need to hire an attorney. All right, back to contingency fee arrangements uh, and how to make sure you maximize them. You are asking the law firm to invest in your case, right? They are going to... Um, put in thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands of dollars of attorney time, paralegal time, other legal staff time into your case. Of course, I mean, most attorneys do this because they want to do it and they're motivated by it, but not completely out of the, the kindness of their heart. This is how law firms make money. So you've got to have a case that makes sense for them on a business uh, perspective to to take the risk and it can you depending on what type of case you have this could go on for months perhaps years uh, that you're going to be working with this law firm and with your lawyer so the first one is perhaps a, a bit obvious but I'm going to state it here don't be a jerk uh, and when you contact the law firm you know don't uh, particularly don't be you know mean to the person who's answering the phone uh, that sort of thing tends to get back to the attorneys and law firm management. And the last thing any law firm wants is somebody who's going to be a difficult client and rude to their own staff. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to be an angel the whole time, but you want to avoid being uh, being being rude. Um, I hope that's not something you need to be reminded of, but to the extent that you do, just remember uh, you're asking them to join you in this battle, and so you want to be friendly. The second thing is um, be responsive. If the law firm, a lot of times, particularly when they're evaluating cases before they'll even sign you up, they may ask for a lot of information. Uh, this is particularly true in employment cases. It's less true in personal injury. Um, you're, they're, they tend to ask for less information up front, but they're still going to ask for some. And obviously, you know, if you are not cooperative with that, you're not you're not providing that information in a timely fashion then that doesn't bode well for how you're going to act when you're a client and when the law firm needs to get information from you to comply with, not only to prosecute your case, but to comply with court orders. So it's always a bad sign when we are uh, talking to folks and they're not responsive, even from the beginning to things that we're asking them about. Um, I would say also be persistent. Um, our firm, the Spiegel Law Firm, we you know really pride ourselves on our customer service. We tend to be very responsive. We get back to people. Um, but that's not true of all firms. That doesn't mean that they're bad firms, but sometimes things get lost. You know, um, it doesn't make it to the, to the attorney's desk. So don't be shy about calling back again. Be friendly, be polite and asking, you know, for an update on your case or seeing if the law firm needs any uh, more information. Um, have your documents ready. Now, this is a little bit of a double edged sword. So you want to have your documents ready, but you don't want to dump tons of documents on the law firm. Um, we've had people contact us before to asking us to take their case, and then they've got like a banker's box full of documents that they, you know, they're saying, hey, here's my case, or they've got something that they've written up that's pages and pages and pages long. Um, and uh, that's uh, what too long do, do, did not read, whatever that, that uh, the, uh, the acronym is for that. Um, that's often what will happen. So have your documents ready, but uh, I would ask the law firm what they need. But for instance, if you've been fired, have if you have a letter, a termination letter, like have that letter. If you filed with the EEOC, make sure that um, that that you're 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 prepared to provide that because we're going to need that, particularly for employment cases, to handle your matter. So have those documents ready. 
provide them promptly, uh, promptly if asked. Um, I would say have a brief description of your case ready that does help. Uh, it doesn't need to be 10 pages. I would say no more than five, really. Uh, and you want to hit the highlights of your case so that, um, you know, they get a, they get a good, you know, the law firm gets a good summary of it. Uh, usually the law firm says, as ours does, you know, will have a, an intake system. They'll ask you questions, but you can't count on that person on the phone necessarily to get everything. It doesn't hurt to follow up with some kind of uh, written statement. It doesn't have to be, you know, it's perfectly spell checked. Um, obviously, you know, avoid typos and that sort of thing, but nobody's going to care that much. Uh, just make sure that you get the salient points, but don't give me a 10 page single spaced summary of your case um, unless I ask for it. Uh, but generally, that's not going to be helpful, at least up front. Um, I would say contact more than one firm. Uh, firms have different risk tolerances. You know, uh, they have different bandwidths. You know, just because one firm doesn't take your case on contingency doesn't mean that another one won't. Uh, you just need to call around and ask. That said, you know, if you've talked to four or five firms, um, they, they've thoroughly reviewed your matter. They've talked to you and they've told you you don't have a case. You probably don't have a case. But that said, you want to be uh, you want to be persistent. You know, another thing that's perhaps a bit obvious, but it's worth saying, like when you contact the firm, let them know that's what you're looking for, that you need a contingency fee arrangement. Some of firms don't do that. You know, don't waste your time, uh, you know, trying to get a firm to take your case on contingency when that's not even a model that they that they um, they offer. So and, and the receptionist, whoever answer, answers the phone should be able to tell you that again. Cases like personal injury, you've been in a car accident, slip and fall. Um, on most law firms, the 99% of them are going to do contingency fee arrangements. Uh, employment laws we discussed in the last episode is a bit mixed, and that's true for, for some other practices as well. Um, I would say also don't, you know, feel free to circle back. You're, you know, just because you contact a firm um, and you they, they, they reject you for a contingency fee matter, uh, doesn't mean that that things won't happen in your life or in your job. We're talking about employment law here that um, that may make the case better for the law firm. So let's say you contacted a firm. You're still with your employer. You haven't been fired yet. As we discussed in the last episode, you know, lost wages are a big piece of the economic pie, the damages available to you, the money you can get at the end of your case. And if you haven't been fired, those aren't there yet. Um, but, you know, uh, right, things happen. You've contacted the law firm, you're still working there, you're having problems, and they say, hey, if you've been fired, you know, call us back. Well, if you get fired, call them back. Uh, you know, the, again, just because you've contacted a firm at one point in your case uh, doesn't mean that later things can't change to make your case better for the law firm to take, um, you know, to take. Um, so those are sort of the things to do to maximize your, to maximize your chance of uh, getting, getting, your case taken on contingency. Um, and you might, I mean, this, you know, just to back up a little bit, uh, you might want to get a sense of whether or not your case is even the type that any firm will take on contingency. You know, like I said in the last episode, if you've got breach of contract, uh, if you're being sued by your former employer, these are cases that it's, I won't say it's impossible, but it's very rare that you're going to find any attorneys to be able to, to, uh, to take the case. Um, and lastly, you know, if you have the resources, you may consider, let's say, initially the law firm, you can't find any law firm that's willing to take your case on contingency, offer to pay for legal services for a time and see, uh, you know, see once you get in the door if the law firm is willing to switch you over contingency. Of course, you want to be transparent with the law firm that, you know, this is something that you're interested in. Um, you know, for instance, you could hire a law firm to contact your employer or former employer to write a demand letter to see what kind of uh, offer you can get, if any. And you may be able and willing to pay to that point, but after that, you, you're going to need a contingency fee arrangement to go any further. It's one way to get a law firm to take your case. And again, while the law firm is developing the facts in order to write that letter, you know, the attorney may look at it and say, you know what, now that I've, I've, I've gotten closer to this case and closer to you, I do think this is worth a contingency fee risk. But again, you want to be upfront with a law firm because if you, you know, if you're expecting to be able to file a lawsuit and you know that you're not going to be able to pay for that uh, and that you just want, you know, you're, you're, you're paying for a demand letter to hope you get a good severance. And if you don't, you know, you're going to want to go 
you know, uh, want to go file something, but you're going to need contingency, just let the law firm know they can help you, um, you know, best strategize how to do that to put you in a good spot. So here are some things not to do, uh, you know, red flags that, that we see that I think a lot of firms see. And again, just a reminder, you know, employment law is a bit different than personal injury, particularly like car accident cases. If you've been in a T-bone car accident um, and you've been injured, man, you're going to have any number of firms that are willing to take that case um, and they're going to take it pretty quickly. So, you know, um, it is a bit different between practice areas. Employment law, you tend to see because it's more risky for the reasons we talked about in the last podcast, because it is more risky, you're going to have law firms uh, kicking the tires a lot more and requiring a lot more information. So just something to be aware of, you know, just because you had a slip and fall case 10 years ago and you had five attorneys willing to take your case without a whole lot of information, uh, it's going to be a little bit different in employment law. So here are the things not to do. And I would say this is true also in PI cases, but particularly in employment law cases. Don't tell the attorney that you know you have you have a case. I mean, you could say, you know, I think I have a case. Like, I think this, the things that happen to me are really bad. Um, but you're not the lawyer, usually. Um, and, and we always th- see it as a red flag when somebody comes to us and like, oh, well, this is a, you know, this is a home run. I know this is a great case. Um, you know, maybe you're right. Chances are you may not be right because you're not the attorney. You haven't evaluated it. Uh, and we take it as a real red flag because we're afraid we're not going to be able to, to, to make you happy in that representation because you made up in your mind that this is a home run uh, and it may be, um, you know, a, a double or a single uh, uh, rather than a home run. And if you're not willing to listen to advice, it's not a case that we're, you know, our firm would be willing to take. Uh, leave your lawyer, your inner lawyer alone. Uh, we've had clients before who, you know, really get into their representation, really start to start to, to, to discover, even though they're not lawyers, discover their inner lawyer and want to work the case or micromanage the case themselves. There's certainly nothing wrong with being actively involved in your case. That can be a great thing for you and the law firm. But you're not the attorney. Um, you need, you've hired somebody for their professional advice and you've got to be willing to take it. So don't, uh, don't try to outlaw your, your lawyer. That's always a red flag, uh, for, uh, for us. Again, getting back to the point we raised earlier, do what the firm asks within reason. If we've asked you for documentation, provide that, you know, in as quickly a manner as you can. If we're asking you for information or for follow-up or you're missing appointments with your lawyer, with the intake team, then that's a red flag for us and we're probably not going to take your case. Um, Be willing to accept professional advice. Look, it's always tough to hear that your case is not as strong as maybe you and your lawyer originally thought or tough to hear that, you know, hey, we've gotten into discovery and we got a really damaging piece of information from your employer, which makes it difficult for your your case to, to you know, for us to win it. You know, we think you could you should take a settlement that's lower than what we'd initially thought you might get. You've got to be willing to listen to your lawyer. That doesn't mean you always have to agree and you can certainly express your opinion. You don't need to be a doormat. Um, but at the same time, if they tell you that, uh, and remember, they're aligned, your, their interests are aligned with yours in a contingency case. You know, the attorney makes more money if you make more money. But if your attorney says, hey, you know, this, is, this isn't looking good, you know, I strongly recommend you accept a lower settlement offer uh, than we originally thought, you've got to be willing to seriously uh, consider that and be willing to accept that professional, um, that professional advice. So those are sort of things that can kind of be a red flag for law firms and can result in you not, your case not being taken on contingency. Um, I hope this is helpful. And if you need a contingency fee arrangement, I certainly hope that um, you get one. Uh, One final piece of advice, uh, and this is true for any employment law cases, is often you you may have more time than you think. Um, So, you know, just because you can't find representation on the terms that you want the first go round, um, it doesn't mean that door is closed forever. And this is particularly true getting a little way for contingency fee if uh, it's a matter of being able to afford some legal services. Let's say, you know, you're willing to pay for a demand letter, but um, open for contingency after that if you need it. Um, you can talk to your attorneys. You can get a consultation and find out when your statute of limitations is, right? When does When's the last chance you have to bring that case? It could be years from now. 
Um, there, you know, there's some things you can do, like filing. If, if it is a case that needs to be filed at the EEOC, you can file it. That will stop the clock running on the limitations period. Um, that's not something it's ideal to have a lawyer, but it's not required. You don't need one to do that. And that sort of that, that, that gives you time to go on with the rest of your life. Find a job if you need one you know, handle any emergencies you may have going on in your life that makes it difficult for you to find representation now. Take care of those things. Then you can circle back and you might find an attorney to take your case. We certainly see that happen all the time. The people come to us that, that some time has passed since the initial event or since they've been fired. Of course, there can be some tight deadlines in employment cases. So, you know, I would recommend, you know, even if you're having trouble finding somebody taking your case on contingency fee, um, you know, try to get some legal advice. Uh, there are many avenues to do that. You can always pay for an hour of consultation. I think it's money that's well worth it. Uh, and your attorney should give you a, can give you a sense like, hey, you've got five days, you know, before you have to file something or you've got a year or more uh, or, you know, here are these other options you can to extend the clock on your case. Because, again, your lifestyle, your things may circumstances may change in your life and you may find that, you know, three months, six months, eight months from now, you know, you're in a better spot to be able to participate in, um, in, in bringing your case and finding an attorney to help you. So I hope that's been helpful to you. Um, if you are interested in getting some more information on employment law, cutting le- uh, edge information, of course, subscribe to this podcast. We always appreciate it or leave us a review. And you can follow me on LinkedIn, where uh, my firm and I often post information about employment law and law-related topics. I wish you the best.